Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Symphony. Tucker. Symphony Entertainment focuses on horror systems, indie games, organic content, and player agency in an attempt to, again, I know it's corny, bring a symphonic approach to horror role playing. I am your host, Bridget Jeffries, and tonight we'll be traveling back to the province of Gévaudan in 18th century France. Uh, this will be part two of my scenario, Beast of Gévaudan, written for Call of Cthulhu, a game published by Chaosium Incorporated. Uh, you can find Beast of Gévaudan in Beit Alazif, issue two. Now, last stream, we gave away two $25 gift cards, one to Chaosium uh, and then another one to drive through RPG. Tonight, uh, at the end of the stream, we're gonna be giving away two different things. We will be giving away a signed copy of Beit Alazif, issue two, and a copy of Rena's newest Miskatonic repository scenario, Saturday the 14th. And if you haven't seen the hype, I guarantee you it is absolutely real. I have read it and it is brilliant. Uh, because I don't do tech, uh, Alex, can you please explain to us how the hell the giveaways work? Yes, uh, <laughs> please go ahead and type in exclamation point beast at any point during the stream tonight and we will do the drawing at the end. Uh, if you you have to be a follower in order to join the giveaway, so click the little follow button, and you'll get a ticket to come in. Woot woot! Thanks, Alex. Uh, and last announcements before we hop back in: if you like this content and you would like to see more of it, Symphony Entertainment does have a Patreon. Tiers are flushed out with everything from behind the scenes content, postcards, AMAs, uh, coaching, playable content, and a lot more. So you can check that out at patreon.com forward slash Symphony Entertainment. So. Without further ado, let's very briefly talk about this cast. And cast, I didn't tell you I was doing this, so uh, just love me. I'm going to do it anyways. Um, I just want to do an FYI <laughs> uh, for those wa watching live or those who may be watching the replay uh, about the six people you see on the screen right now. Uh, two of us are sick. Uh, one has been sick for the last couple of days, and the other one very likely has COVID. Uh, one of us is grieving the loss of a loved one. Three of us have had really shitty mental health weeks. Uh, one of us just wrapped up a family emergency and one of us barely made it home today because their city is washed out by a downpour. So why am I telling you all of this information? Um, one, it means a lot to me because I sent a message to our like uh, cast chat. It said, hey guys, listen, uh, life over gaming always. If you don't have the bandwidth, if you don't have the ability, if you're not in the mood to do this stream, it's completely okay, just pull out. And every single one of them showed up tonight. Every single one of them is here. So uh, one, Thank you, Cass, not only for showing up and being here for me, but also being here and showing up for Symphony and the viewers. Uh, and to anybody listening to me or hearing my voice, uh, whatever the fuck you do in life, please be kind because you genuinely have no idea what someone else is going through. So with that being said, before I start getting weepy and cry because I'm light skinned and it's gonna look weird, uh, cast members, <laughs> <laughs> can you please introduce yourselves? Tell us where people can find you, uh, the things that you do, and for now, just the name and the occupation of your investigator. And we're going to kick it off, I believe, starting with Heinrich. Well, greetings, Symphony, and thank you so much, Bridget, for those words. I'm pretty sure all of us uh, feel the same way. We wouldn't miss this for the world. Uh, so, uh, Symphony, my name is Heinrich Mohr. I am a community organizer and sometimes author on the Miskatonic Repository, Chaosium's uh, community content program on drive through RPG. Um, I run a little convention called Miskatonic Repository Convention with a few of my friends, including uh, Bridget. Um, so keep a lookout for that. And if you ever want to see more, uh, check out uh, Heinrich Mohr Presents on YouTube. Today, I will be playing Cesare Russo, the Black Musketeer. Beautiful. Kicking it on over to, what is this, Alex? I can, I can read technology. I'm over here. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. My name is Alex. I am uh, the assistant line developer for Mutants Masterminds over at Green Running Publishing, as well as the author of the Titan City Chronicles and the executive producer of the Untold Stories Project. Uh, you can follow me over at alexanderwrites.com to get all the fun stuff. Uh, and tonight, I will be playing the role of Pascal, who is everyone's favorite monster-slaying hero werewolf expert. <laughs> <laughs> all of that is true do not check the don't check the character sheet that's uh, a I'll... full body lie <laughs> <laughs> and the whole thing was a lie it was great uh, uh, we love it we love it we love it sorry keep going i will pass it down to rena so hey y'all i'm rena uh you know me from the old ways podcast where i play lady elizabeth fitzroy on the horror on the orient express campaign and also where i run blood moon rising my custom Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle, 
uh, which is pretty fantastic. And Bridget is joining us for that in our next season, which is awesome. Uh, you might also know me from Ain't Slayed Nobody, where I play Patience Cartwright uh, on the main arc, Y'all of Cthulhu, and on the uh, World War Cthulhu London arc of, uh, let's see, the meat trade. So we've been doing that for a while. Uh, as Bridget mentioned, my new scenario, Saturday the 14th, is out on Drive-Thru RPG, and we'll be doing a giveaway on this uh, on this stream, which is awesome. It's an homage to classic slasher flicks, so I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, and you can find me on Discord, Twitter, etc. On Twitter, I'm GlitterFayThey, and on Discord, you can find me as Rena, and I am all over the place for about 24-7, because I have no life. So, thanks for having me, Bridget. Uh, so I suppose that's me. Uh, my name is Mike Diamond. I am the head of the Old Ways podcast. Uh, I bring you an array of horror and dramatic role-playing uh, over there in podcast format. Uh, and I'm also on the Muscatown uh, repository with Time of the Serpent, uh, which just hit its next medal, which is nice. Hopefully we'll see it in print on demand shortly. And tonight I'll be playing Gabriel Devereaux, one of our fantastic twins. Yes, I forgot to mention I'm playing the other one, but I thought that was just everybody knew that because you're obviously here for me. So I didn't think I need to needed to mention that I'm playing Brigitte Devereaux, the sexiest of the twins. But here we are. <laughs> oh, well, how do I follow all of that? Um, I am Nubish Indian Girl. I'm actually not a content creator, so I'm so stoked to be surrounded by a cast of very talented creatives. I have a very small Instagram under Newish Indian Girl, but otherwise, if you want to find me, I'm on Bridget's server. Come hang out. There's a whole channel just for pet pictures. It is amazing. So um, that's enough about me. I am playing your playwright, Armand Dupont. I love you guys. Just your whole faces and voices can just lift a room. I love you guys. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, just as a note to the viewers, I have review content warnings with the cast and crew. They understand the X card is in play. No judgment passed. No, uh, no questions asked. Now, uh, because startup struggles are super real, we might have lost. And by we might have lost, we 100% <laughs> lost the entire first episode. <laughs> Startup struggles. Listen, you fall on your face, you get back up, you do what you have to do. Uh, but because we lost the first half, uh, we wanted to do something cool and something sexy for the recap. So actually, uh, friends Heinrich and Evan came up with this idea. And uh, I'm going to actually hand the screen over to Heinrich and Nubish Indian, girl, uh, Nubish Indian Girl so they can get us caught up on what you might have missed on episode one. Well, greetings again, Symphony. We find ourselves in the latter half of the 18th century. My name is Cesare Rousseau, a black musketeer in the service of God through his servant on earth, the Cardinal Marzen. It is my task to remove those who have fallen out of the good graces of his most Roman Catholic church. It was thus with some surprise that I found myself to be tasked with the hunt for a different type of beast in the French region of Gévaudan, as well as to take the temperature of the people there, my sources had told me that revolution might be in the air following the suppression of the order of Jesuits by the King of France. In my hunt, I did not journey alone. I traveled in the company of a most curious set of travelers, one of them, a playwright. My name is Armand Dupont, royal playwright to His Majesty King Louis XV. Tasked by the Duke of Chizel, Chizel, Sh you know, it is what it is, with investigating the murder of the men, women, and children, not to mention the death of Inquisitor Raphael de Long, at the hands of a fearsome beast terrorizing the region for the past three years. Besides myself and the Black Musketeer Cesare, there were three others. Two of them siblings, Gabrielle and Brigitte Devereaux, both fearsome hunters of wild game to stalk his royal highness's private zoological collection. And one of them, perhaps a witch, cursed by the devil with the power of foresight through the sacrilegious tarot. Their manner and appearance were provocative, to say the least, and their fraternal relationship was close. Indeed, you would scarce find any who are fonder of one another than two of them. Also with us was Pascal Favre, the beast slayer of Lyon. Oh, famed far and wide, though it must be said of late, the whip has been more in his waist. 
if you know what I mean. Underneath that man's soft exterior, I sense steel. One to watch, I say. The five of us set off from the palace at Versailles. We had traveled for several weeks when we came upon the outskirts of Jabot. There we were set upon by a band of three children, two boys and one girl. I saw the black musketeer Cesare give them some food. It was obvious that the boys were not interested in sharing their spoils with the girl who stood meekly by. There was something special about the girl. We all could sense it, especially Brigitte. Also, something of a resemblance between the girl and the musketeer. Uh, jealous of not being the center of our attention, the boys pushed the girl off the road into a ditch. I went after the girl, naturally. She told me her name was Chloe and that she had been an orphan. But she said she had a papa who took care of her. Before running off, she actually offered me a talisman and upon it was etched the image of a wolf. We proceeded into Javel. This was not, not my first time in the city, but much had changed in the 10 years since I last visited. I decided to follow up with some of my prior acquaintances. While Cesare went to the brothel, the rest of us went to see the Marquis. On our way, I had a most strange encounter with one of the canines roaming the streets in search of scraps. I consider myself an animal lover, especially a dog lover, but this dog growled and bared its teeth at me. I couldn't be sure, but I thought perhaps it was looking at my talisman. My acquaintance, Cosette, had aged 10 years, but she had lost none of her gifts of gab. Suitably compensated, she relayed much about the first four victims of the supposed beast, each of them slain within the confines of the city we found ourselves in. There was the Mademoiselle Emily de Clare, the headmistress of the local orphanage, found dead in the gardens behind the orphanage and brutally slain. There was Jacques de Monet, a binder of books, slain in his home office by the same beast. Father Jean-Pierre Arnon, a Jesuit priest slain in the city's chapel. And Francois de Menarque, a minor noble, slain in his home. And now, of course, there was Inquisitor de Long, the body of whom, according to Cesare's acquaintance, lay still where he had been slain. The townsfolk too frightened to move the body. I hurried to catch up to my companions. But we had already entered the Marquis' home. You guys are incredible. By the way, they built that all by themselves with like zero supervision, very limited input for me. Thank you guys for the recap to the lost episode. We love you. So we're going to dial in right now. Armand, you have shut the door and that uh, the eyes, the piercing, um, bright blue eyes of this wolf are staring at you as the door kind of, you know, latches into place and you can, you know, see just the tail of his skirt off. Meanwhile, Bridget, you had blood running down the inside of the wall that were picking up uh, in intensity and it was running faster and stronger. You're starting to hear it. Uh, and just as that door shut, the blood just began to pull itself off of the wall, splashing into you, turning you about left and right. No matter which way you turn at this point, the blood from the wall is coming at you fast and you're desperate to escape, but you can't breathe. You're drowning currently and blinded by blood. You can taste them in your mouth, them so so many victims, so many senseless deaths, and just so much trauma and pain. And somewhere in the echoes of your mind, you hear the sound of a man laughing, but there's something about his voice. You know the sound and it just sets your hackles on edge. There's something in his voice that's filled with lust. And that lustful laugh is bouncing off the wall. And then there's something else under that, keys rattling, the sound of like, the cast iron ring with multiple keys, and then everything goes dark. Uh, Brigitte, you are in a room. It is wet uh, from what you can smell, from what you can feel with the moisture and the damp and the cold, you're underground. There is no light anywhere and you have never longed for light the way that you do right now up until the moment that you see it. Uh, you must be in some type of hell chamber because beneath a door, a slim beam of light 
uh, radiates, but something is wrong. This light brings with it pain, humiliation, and sorrow. A door slams somewhere else in the recess as you're holding. You hear a voice scream, make it stop. Ashes pull themselves from the ground in front of you to form a shape. It's the shape of your mother, your mother. Maybe not your biological mother, but the woman who taught you and your brother everything from enjoying the dark arts to enjoying each other. And she smiles at you faceless behind a hood. And she says, orphans, no. Orphans, see. Seek the orphanage first. And that's when you collapsed. I'm pulling your power roll from last time. That's when you collapse. The rest of the night is quiet. The marquee makes you guys tea. Uh, he brings uh, damp, cool rags to Gabriel, who I'm sure is attending to you. Uh, as you keep cycling through, Brigitte, the same feverish, sweat-screaming dream again and again into the morning. Uh, this will buy time for Cesare uh, to finally make his way back. And I am going to start you all at breakfast once everyone is awake, including you, Brigitte, uh, where you can sit down and you can have an invitation uh, with the marquee, but I'm going to save Brigitte for last, and I'm going to start in the same order that we did introductions. Um, Cesare, can you give me two, three sentences, quick, fast, in a hurry, on what your night looked like? I would not have immediately caught up with my companions following mm -hmm. a meeting with my acquaintance. Um, the fact is, it was simple information gathering, and anything more I might have wanted to have happen, well, I apparently did not have the uh, enough to pay for that. And so uh, I would have simply wandered the streets until uh, an appropriate time to slink my way indoors. Okay. Uh, when you finally do slink yourself indoors, you're going to see a myriad, a collage, a montage of pretty much of the other descriptions that you're about to get. Um, Pascal, kind of tell us uh, in a handful of sentences or less what your night looked like. Pascal went to bed. <laughs> He got to sleep on a feather mattress for the first time in two weeks? Yeah, no. I I stripped naked, stood on the balcony and air showered, and went to sleep. Good man. I'm so pr I'm so happy you're here, Alex. <laughs> uh, I am going to hop over to Armand de Pont. What does your night look like? I feel like I was just thinking about that dog for a while, being like, can dogs see like into people's souls? So people always say that, you know, dogs are wonderful companions, but I feel like that dog knew something about me that I didn't know about myself. Mm. Oh God, that was really creepy, beautifully articulated. <laughs> oh God, Jesus, this, I'm a new player, my ass. <laughs> uh, Gabrielle, what does your night look like? It probably looks a lot like playing sentry duty it's probably watching over my sister and assisting her when i can and making sure that our time is very limited here beautiful um rena brigitte we are going to close up with you you've been unconscious most of the night cycling through this dream give me a brief narrative of what that looked like to your brother who's probably mm -hmm. you know who is overlooking you and then just kind of how you come out of it in the morning so i think i was in like in bed but kind of tossing and turning and kicking off any blankets or, or linens or anything which i would have done anyway but you know it, it's a lot more violent uh, this way and lots of sweat and just kind of crying in a way that Gabriel isn't used to hearing because Brig Brigitte is kind of tough and um, e even when she's emotional around him she doesn't sound scared ever and she does when she's having this dream um, and so um, when I, I think I kind of wake up and just kind of startle back in bed because I'm looking around and I'm expected to be covered in blood and just sort of feeling around for where I am and I can't see for a moment and I start crying for, for Gabriel because I don't know where I am. I haven't seen this room before. It's brand new and that's terrifying. Wow. Um, Rena, you get me every fucking time on your descriptions. Beautifully done, by the way. <laughs> Beautifully done. Uh, so the following morning, you all are able to have uh, breakfast in the Marquis de Leon's um, 
well, it's not really his um, one of his many dining rooms because most of them have been packed up, stored away, or sold to just keep what patches he could on the roof. So he's probably hosting you in the kitchen. Um, this is going to be one of those things where there's lukewarm water and there uh, is fresh fruit. And he probably was able to manage some eggs. Um, he looks, because he's a young man. Remember, he's in his early 20s. But guys, he looks like he's knocking on the door of just 40, 50 years old from just sheer stress. He looks exhausted. His eyes are dark. Um, and whatever has happened to him over the past few years of him being in charge, uh, it has truly racked his confidence uh, because he has a hard time maintaining eye contact with you guys. Uh, you'll ask him questions and he kind of blinks and there's a moment where he can't really get back to you and then he does. Uh, so you're all gathered around the table uh, right now. And Brigitte, you are finally downstairs up and about. And he says, apologies, that is not much. It's it's what I have. Um, you are most welcome. You are most welcome to continue to stay here. Uh, otherwise, there are many, many, many abandoned buildings and homes uh, that you could take up occupancy. Um, and the brothel always has rooms uh, for let. But you're most welcome to stay here. I appreciate you all for coming. <clears throat> we won't be here long. Stay long here. Night, man. I will not stay here another night. I understand. We'll have this beast killed today. Don't worry about it. Pascal, he looks to you and he goes to say something. It's just like he almost can't even bring himself to commit to anything to that nature. He just nods. We understand that Inquisitor DeLong was investigating the matter prior to his death. Yes. Yes, he died. My Apologies. Please continue. That's him, just what you're getting from his vibe. My understanding is that the first four victims, and now I will sort of begin to discuss the information that I discovered the previous night for the benefit of uh, my companions, um, but also sort of to just to information check. Um, and so I will say, you know, our understanding is that the first four victims were all slain within the walls of this city. And then I will recount the information about the Mademoiselle and the orphanage, as well as the, uh, the Jesuit priest in the chapel and the minor lord, so that we're all caught up on that. And just to see what his reaction is, make sure that this information I received from my acquaintance, Cosette, uh, is accurate. Yeah. I mean, she's always been, you know, on the drop of a penny for her information. And as of what you're getting uh, from the marquee, uh, just every name sinks him a little bit lower and every name sinks him a little bit lower. But he's giving you nods of affirmation with each and every statement that you're making. Yes, those I'll are make sure, I'll make sure to sort of menace a little bit and rise a little bit every time he slinks down as we recount the names. <laughs> Double Brigitte. time, and you can see him scooting back. Brigitte is pacing up and down. Like, I can't sit still, don't want to sit in a chair, just occasionally looking at him and kind of cocking my head a little bit, but just prowling, almost like a, a cat. And then when Cesare's finished his recitation, just sort of look up and go, we must go to the orphanage first. We start there. And I look at Gabriel. Maman, she said. Mm-hmm. I seem, I seem to brighten almost immediately. That is where we will go. Are you saying your mother was here? Mother is always here. Always. Mm. She is never not here. Just sometimes more visible than others. This is one of those things that you both have that is crazy. <laughs> crazy? Do not the um, religions of the world teach you to revere those who have passed? Uh, I am Catholic. I fear the things who have passed, not revere. <laughs> no, you should stop that. <laughs> Whatever Catholic. our respective beliefs, I think the reasoning of the siblings is sound. Pascal, do you concur? I think we should just go out in the woods with our crossbow and shoot this thing, but if you want to go down into the orphanage and look around for clues or whatever, I'm here for it. You want to go out in the woods by yourself, little man, and try and shoot it all by yourself with your bare hands? It would not be the first time means. I have killed a beast on my own. 
by hands. all means, by all means, go. No one will miss you. Damn! <laughs> uh, the Marquis steps, um, or at least speaks up a bit, and he says, um, Monsieur Russo, you are you are aware that the orphanage fell to a fire some three years ago, yes? I doubt you will find much. Then it shall be a quick visit. Was it an accident, or did somebody burn all the orphans? No. No, the orphans, they made it out. Um, they were escorted from... I'm sorry. Uh, they were escorted from the orphanage, um, and they were put into the care of the Jesuit church uh, until they were distributed out um, to families that could take them or homes. I have... Raphael asked for those records as well. I have them. He was gone before, and just he kind of continues with that muttering, rambling, whatever the fuck that is. Uh, he gets up, uh, and he is going to go um, into an office that's just a couple doors down. He's going to bring back a scroll. And Alex, would you be so kind as to tee me up the handout? I believe it is, you know, technology and things. It's something like orphans. Surviving orphans. Find something that says orphans. Find something that says orphans. I've got Rounds something that orphans. says orphanage. It's up on screen <laughs> nah, did now. I did I not send you the handout? I might not send it to you. Children know rescued from the orphanage fire in the Look night at of God. 5 June. Yeah, that's what he has, you guys. Yay, I can tech. I don't tech. <laughs> uh, so he will hand that to you with a uh, very slow, trembling hand there, Cesare. And while that um, uh, handout is getting prepped, uh, Nubish, I feel like Cesare would probably not ask your opinion about where we should go next, but are you, as a player, good with this? Oh, yeah. I mean, I before the handout popped up, I was like, well, I wonder if Chloe came from that orphanage, but I can see that that she probably she's on that list. So um, anything to learn more about that girl? How long ago was this? Fire? Some three years now. OK, and the little girl we saw looked to be about 11. Yeah, about that, about 10, 11, 12, somewhere around here. Brigitte is already walking barefoot towards the door, just like, what are we waiting for? We decide where we go. We go! <laughs> okay. You no should put on shoes. This... Uh, fire hazard is no joke. I, I think I might... What to do again and see what happens. <laughs> I think Armand is going to try to get everyone out of the Marquis' house, because I feel like the Marquis is, has been really struggling to stay composed this entire time, so he's he going to is... be like, everyone, let's head out. And we're out. And we're out. Okay. Mr. Marquis, there should be protein in my dinner when I return. Mm -mm. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> the audacity with your broke ass. <laughs> in game. I'm not being mean to Alex. Y'all are okay. <laughs> they, were having a, they had a 50% sale at the audacity store, okay? It's a summer sale. <laughs> okay uh you guys make your way uh through the town of javals and as i described before um this place has been hit with its fair share of just abandonment economic drought and disaster you have all of these homes uh that have been crumbled or fallen to ruin it's just uh, you don't see many people out and about uh, and it doesn't take you long um to find out where the orphanage is. Um, it's one of those things that none of these locals are going to give you directions because they hate you, all of you. But Cesare knows approximately where it is, and he's probably able to talk. So here's what you guys are going to get when you come upon the orphanage. The orphanage fell to fire almost three years ago, and there have been no efforts to clean it up or restore it. The ruins look very unstable and dangerous with, you know, these age-old roasted bricks, singed timber, and just crumbled debris everywhere. Uh, as you guys approach, uh, you do notice that the orphanage is sitting at the end uh, of a street. And you can see that directly on the right and the rear of it are two other warehouse-looking buildings. And as you guys approach this debris and this crumble and you're walking around, those seedier characters, I won't make you roll anything, you know who you are, are like walking around through the overgrown grass and you're looking around at the 
back of this orphanage uh, where there's just, you know, um, long, big field of grass with the white picket fence that's been long, you know, torn down, chewed up by the fire. But you're looking around it's like, you know what? This is a really secluded area back here. None of these warehouses have any windows that look in. None of them have any doors that look in. Like you could have a sacrificial murder back here and no one would ever notice. It's that type of just gloomy, uncomfortable feel. Uh, and as you're looking at the collapsed rear of the building, again, I've already described this overgrown garden, you see this massive uh, 10 foot tall stone angelic statue. Uh, it's sitting on a pedestal that's sitting about a foot up. Uh, it has its hands praying. Uh, her head is bowed with like the stone hair flowing over. She's got these massive wings that extend from her back. Um, the one thing you notice looking at this statue is it has deep claw marks through the face across the chest and across the waist and the old months old probably years old but uh as you guys approaching you're looking at this statue anyone who wants it can roll me a survival check or even i'll give you a track check to give you some ideas about these claws don't blink guys <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly i oh. roll i will roll i'm an expert on this topic yeah you are oh i got a 17 nice. oh wow Oh, damn. Probably a hard success for you, right? I rolled, I rolled an eight. Damn! I got a 17 <laughs> over oh, that's 50. A, that's an extreme on my track. Yeah, it's a hard I for me. I declined to roll. I, I honestly <laughs> don't. I honestly say it. I, my scores are abysmal. <laughs> so you're like, no, I'm not even worried about it. All right. that, that, that's definitely why. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that's, that's why. I love that Pascal succeeded with a hard success and still got shown up. <laughs> you know what guys things that make me very 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 happy okay uh the three of you who just knocked this shit out of the park what i'm gonna do is just uh I'll read you data because you knocked it out of the park the fun thing is trying to find that data where'd you put it jared i know you're in chat tell me where'd you put it out oh, here we go so um you're looking Library at these roll <laughs> right, I failed those two. Tech and library roots. I just, I, just, I don't have any ranks in them. Sorry. Um, you guys, the three of you, are looking at these deep claw marks that have just been pulled out of this marble statue, and you're able to pick up uh, the following information: uh, the beast, from what you can tell, has to be bipedal, because mm -hmm. if something is a quadruped and was able to reach this high and do this type of damage you'd be really impressed. This is unlike anything that you've ever seen before. Given the size of the claw marks, this thing has to weigh at least 900 kilo, uh, kilograms and has to stand at least two meters high at its shoulder. No beast of this size has ever been recorded, nor should such a creature exist within the confines of nature. Also, animals don't attack stone statues, and this looks pretty deliberate. Not usually. Not usually, uh, but you know, Folk do what they want, I guess. This isn't just attack, though. This is uh, multiple fierce attacks, right? So yeah, it isn't just one. This is intentional. Yeah. This is vandalism from a werewolf. I cannot believe werewolf. you all are not werewolf. believing me. It is two meters tall. It's bipedal. It's got big claws. It's a werewolf. Werewolves don't I exist. Ask, I, 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 consult the twins. I'm sure they would echo the same thing. No, they exist. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> we've never said that they don't exist, Armand. We've simply disagree with the description the, and the story of him killing one. I turn around. It wasn't one. It was four. I killed four with my bare hands. Of course you Last did. Last time you said three. Which is it? The story changes I... as I remember it, Armand. And Cesare, as they are having this conversation and you're looking at these deep claw marks that you, you opted not to roll for because, you know, let people in their lane do what they want to do. Uh, you step back to get just like a better view of this entire uh, angelic figurine and uh, your left heel jumps uh, beneath the uh, grass and the foliage and the overgrowth. There's, oh, uh, you know, these, these are those trap doors that sit on the floor. It's a wooden one that doesn't have a latch on. It's very deep, but you can feel it you know, on your left heel as you stepped back. I would imagine that as everyone else is having a discussion about the 
very useful and important information they found, but that I'm totally oblivious to. Um, I will be imagining, you know, this woman having been slain brutally because she was found in the course of them trying to put out the fire. So all yeah. of this was happening together. And so I, I imagine as I'm walking around this three old crime scene, um, I would stumble upon um, the trap door and I'll just mm -hmm. like open it. I won't announce anything. Like they'll just be in the conversation and then there'll be a creak as the door opens. Okay. Uh, it takes you just uh, not as long as you would think to cut away the grass. It's almost as if somebody in the last month had been here before you. Uh, also, the door wasn't latched. So somebody has been here within the last month. You could probably assume it was your inquisitor. But uh, guys, like as you're arguing, werewolves exist. No, they don't. What? By the way, that was fucking hysterical. <laughs> like you just see this, this wooden door open um, into the earth. Uh, and it's one of those things where Brigitte, you have a brief moment where you're just like, fuck, I need to make another power check because I'm about to go back into that loop. Like as soon as that door opens, you can feel yourself like, I... God, but mama let you know that this is where you needed to be. So you're just be able to hold on without me forcing a roll on you, but the door opens and you guys can see a flight of stairs heading down. Uh, before I go anywhere towards the creepy stairs, I'm drawing a tarot card to see what the cards tell me is about to happen. I need an actual tarot check, please. Okay. And I will also draw a card at the same time. Uh -huh. It's weird. You have a red flag yes. card in your tarot. <laughs> <laughs> Is that X card? <laughs> no, no. It's the tower inverted. Uh -huh. Okay. Four. Ooh. Under 70. Mm. Holy shit. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you more than you asked for, and apologies in oh, advance. God. But what are you asking for? Okay. Um... I'm looking into what potential dangers might await us down there. Okay. Which is, um, which works because I drew the moon and the, oh. moon tells, the moon tells you that you'll find answers to your questions in dark, unexplored places. So. Fucking flawless, Rena. Seren serendipity. <laughs> Holy shit. Okay. Um. <laughs> That's what we'll be thinking as we are being torn apart by the beast. <laughs> oh, for yeah, sure. At least yeah, the tarot kidding. worked out. Mm -hmm. At least the, the, the tarot was right. You know? Listen, in and out of game. Uh, yeah, so if you're asking about what dangers await you, Brigitte, um, whatever danger was down here is long past. It's gone. The danger is no longer present for everyone except for you. This is a very dangerous place for you to go, not from a physical safety standpoint, but from a psychological and an emotional standpoint. This is going to be a big challenge for you. And with a four, which is damn near calling mom on the phone being like, hey, how do we feel about this? There's nothing anyone can do to protect you from this. This is one of those you're just going to have to take on the chin and eat it. Because this is some bullshit. <laughs> what did your there mama say? There is no danger say? down there for you. There is no danger down there for you. Go on, go on. And then I'm going to um, take Gabriel's arm and say, uh, there is something down there I do not want to see. But I will have to, so you must uh, protect me. Certainly. <sighs> Don't worry, I'll go first. You know, go down the tunnel. Uh, yes, so happy to go first when I say there is no danger, of course. <laughs> like uh, teed up his moment uh pascal the wooden trap door opens onto a set of uh, built-in stone stairs that leads about four meters down into the darkness uh at the base of the stairs from what you can see as soon as you land uh there is a short hallway on either side of the hallway uh there is a single closed wooden door so to the right uh closed wooden door to the left another closed wooden door about 15 meters straight down this hallway, that's when your visibility starts getting really shaky because the light isn't bouncing and carrying that far down. But you think you see maybe a rope hanging from the ceiling? It's still, so you're not sure. You just need a little bit more light. Well, I will light a torch if I have one. Okay. Or a lantern, uh, whatever is time period appropriate. Okay. You light up your air quotations light source. Uh, you can see a little bit better. 
<laughs> Turn on the flashlight, yeah. Uh, and everyone can see a little bit better now. Um, there are multiple things that stick out to you now. One, uh, it does not appear that this area was touched by any fire. You're not seeing any residual fire damage. You're not seeing any burns. You're not seeing anything about this. Uh, it's peculiar. You saw the doors to your left and your right, but now that you have a lantern up, uh, the light is dancing out the walls and you recognize that they have um, sliding bolt locks on the outside of the doors. Two of them each. Does that rope hanging from the ceiling look like a noose? Oh, good leap. No. As you're looking at the rope hanging from the ceiling, uh, you're catching half of a rope ladder where the rungs, the other rung have fallen off and now it's just kind of like loose and limp. And it's leading up to another trap door that if you're looking over your shoulder and you're looking forward, you're like, okay, if somebody came in through the back entrance here, came down this hallway, that should put them directly up into the belly of the orphanage somewhere. Not to be called a coward, I will take my considerable mass to the rope bridge and try to climb my way up into the orphanage. Okay. Um... I am going to, just because I want to see this shit, uh, I'm going to have you roll me a climb check, please, and I'm going to wrap back to the other four people. I was so wondering, is she going to go luck roll? Is she going to make him do a size <laughs> check? <laughs> climb. Ooh. Very good. Very What's good. he going to do? Did you make that? No, I failed by 30. Good for <gasps> you. Oh, I'm so proud of you. I'm going to give you narrative on what this looks like in a minute. But first, I'm going to tie over to Brigitte, Gabrielle, Armand, and Cesare. This is what you guys see, and uh, uh, Pascal has gone down the hallway to try to climb this rope. If it's not dangerous, why are we bothering with it? Something to find, maybe. I think I need to see. Why the idiot is going down there, I don't know. He'll hurt himself. I take my hand and lead my sister down just a little bit. Just stand in front of her, let her know that I'm there um, probably to, to take whatever comes first in case there is something and um, make sure that we can get down these stairs. Okay. I always enjoy it when you go down first. <laughs> da -da -da -da. 50 shades of Jevu Don is back, it's back, it's back, it's back, it's back. <laughs> ah, don't worry, guys. They didn't forget about you. I've been waiting on it too. Um... <laughs> I feel like uh, I'm going to uh, wait for everyone else to go down, and then I'll have one of those intrusive <laughs> thoughts where I think, if I just slammed the shut, I wonder if you could open it on the inside. Then I wave the thought away and uh, follow in. Your murder thoughts this whole game have been fantastic. Armand? <laughs> um, I, so we see that there are doors, even like down here, but there are latches on the outside of them. Yeah. Right? Yep, latch, mm -hmm. bolt latches on the outside. Can I undo them somehow? Can I to open the doors? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm going to reverse this super fast. Uh, Brigitte, you and Gabrielle come down the steps. Gabrielle has you. Um, the second you hit the bottom of the steps and you, know, uh, you have Pascal's light kind of illuminating, um, you realize that loop, that psychological trauma loop that you got caught in was down here. Except you were on the other side of one of these doors and that little beam of light that you saw was the light coming as if you were on the inside of one of these locked chambers and the light came on. Armand, you open up uh, the two doors. It's a slunk uh, and a slunk. Um, Cesare, uh, Cesare, you were at the top of the stairs. You're uh, entertaining yet another murder fantasy. When Pascal, go ahead and give me narrative. Yeah. On so, this, because you're about to fall. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm being very safe. I take the bottom half of the rope ladder and I tie it around my waist because clearly you have to be secured. <laughs> And I get up a couple of rungs, and I get towards the top of the chamber, and there's this great straining noise of rope and wood splintering, and I fall right on my coccyx. <laughs> <laughs> and I let out this noise like a whoopee cushion, losing all of its air at once. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, the twins can enjoy this. Oh, we do. Oh, this, this, will, make, this will make a wonderful chapter in your book. <laughs> Armand, you're able to enjoy this in your peripheral vision. And Cesare, if you're just coming down the steps, that's when you hear the, the whoopee cushion evacuation sound. <laughs> I, I will commission a sketch of this for your book when it comes out. It's just him foretelling the uh, soon to be uh, failing French government. <laughs> Holy shit. Everyone, everyone this uh, rope ladder is haunted. <laughs> by the smell of your onions, yes. My, ghost. <laughs> my coccyx is Armand, haunted. You open the door and you peer into a little smaller chamber. 
Uh, from what you can tell, that this chamber is maybe 25 feet by 25 feet. It is uh, has a completely stone interior. On the far left-hand corner, uh, there is a small straw bed. Then opposite the bed, there's a large brown metal looking trunk. Um, it looks like the lock on the outside of the trunk uh, has been picked uh, because it's on the ground, but the, the, the lid of the trunk uh, is closed. And uh, that's what you see in the room. Brigitte and Gabrielle can hear a voice just it floats onto the air and it dissipates just as quickly. Make it stop. Armand, what do you do? Um, I probably walk in and, you know, I probably call to Cesare being like, is this, this doesn't seem normal. Who needs, who needs something like this under an orphanage? And I slowly make my way over with the intention of lifting the lid off the trunk. Okay. Cesare, are you coming down with that? Yeah, I, uh, I, I feel good for Armand to not sort of have the real thoughts of, oh yeah, what would a room like this be for? Um, I see the chests, are, did you say the chests are locked? They were locked, somebody picked the locks. So the locks are on the ground, but they're just closed. You know, I appreciate that uh, you don't always make us make rolls, but sometimes we actually have points in these skills. Uh, I know, them. it's like, damn, I gotta pick oh, this. Well. Someone was here before you. All right, I will, um, I'll continue watching uh, Armand's back from a safe distance. All right. Armand, you open up that trunk. Uh, you can see on the inside, it's lined with like this really gorgeous plush. I mean, it's deteriorating now, but it was like this gorgeous pink silk. Uh, and as you are looking through the, uh, the trunk, uh, you recognize that it's just full of clothes. Lots and lots and lots of clothes. But as you thumb through the clothes, as you pick up, as you inspect the clothes, um, two things hit you immediately. Uh, one, these are all erotic, highly sexualized costumes. These aren't just regular clothes. And then I'm gonna need a sand check from you when you hold up an outfit and realize that it's size for children. I was about to ask if that was the case. Oh man. What is my, oh. I pass by like three. Ooh, bravely done. You take zero points as you're holding up some hypersexualized outfit that's made for an eight-year-old. I think uh, I hold it up and I just look to Cesare really sadly with a really sad look on my face. You will see Cesare actually look, sort of show some emotion and look sad. Uh, and then it'll pass very quickly. Well, I guess that, that answers my own question. I am dying to hear from the twins in the hallway. I mean, do I we, don't... Do yeah, we see do we this see or... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You guys see it. Especially when Armand is, like, you know, holding it up for us as a view. So, Brigitte is kind of trembling with rage. I think just the fear of coming down is now overwhelmed just by the anger uh, and probably a bit of PTSD at the same time. And so I think I'm going to ignore the scared part, and I'm going to lean back against the wall and close my eyes, and I'm going to try and tune in with this place. Ooh, and the place that literally told you don't do it? I am so excited for us. I'm angry. I love it. Sometimes oh, you gotta open players. yourself up you have to open yourself up to danger sometimes if you're going to fix things and someone's going to die. Okay. Gabrielle, and then I'm going to hop back over to Pascal. Yeah, I think my reaction is mostly dis mostly pitted in disgust. Um, and I instantly want to know who's who is in charge of this place um, because it's clear to me that um, the kids that we met on the way in were abused in pretty pretty horrendous ways and someone should pay for that uh armand before i hop over to pascal uh, he's pulling himself off the ground beautifully articulated by the way bike uh armand um you're holding up this outfit to cesare and you think to yourself that statement she made to you that triggered her so deeply no one should hear my story mm -hmm. oh. you made the statement 
people should hear your story. And that was the turning point that triggered her. Uh, Pascal, there's a lot of really heavy, dark shit happening behind you, but just fell on your ass and whoopee cushion. What's going on with you over there, babe? Uh, Pascal is going to have a brief moment of non-oafishness <laughs> and walk over to Armand and put a hand on Armand's shoulder and say, sometimes places deserve to get burned down. Oh, I wish we could finish the job. Oh, I feel, oh, I should have, I, oh, I, and I told, I told the girl, oh, and I think Armand is just going to just, you know, obviously drop the clothes and just like put his face in his hands, reflecting on what he said to Chloe. Armand, we Ooh, that feels like a one point sand loss, by the way. Oh yeah, that, that's fair. Armand, we could still help that child. They're still alive. That's true. I, I worry though. She, she says there, she said she was an orphan. She says she has a papa that's taking care of her. What if, what if this is just another person who's manipulating her? Well, this would be perhaps Victor, the blacksmith, I ask. Uh, per the handout, that's who her, her, her uh, father is now. Mm -hmm. That's where she went three years ago. Um, Brigitte? Let me get a tarot check, baby. And you can roll with a bonus die just because I love the fact that I literally told you don't come down here. And you was like, I'm going <laughs> to tune into this place. <laughs> That's an ex uh, exact 70 on 70. But let me roll the bonus. Huh? Oh, that takes it down to a 10. Oh! <laughs> Holy shit. Okay. okay. Um, This is... a half tear between the supernatural force and a half uh, comfort of a uh, just an investigative one that you're kind of coming down this thin line. But you're stuck in that loop again uh, where the keys are jangling. Uh, you can hear the make it stop. You can hear the lustful laughter. You can see the light coming. You recognize that the light brings danger. Um, but while that's happening on one side, you're being drawn to that rope. Uh, there is something that awaits you um, at the top of that um, at the top of wherever that rope goes. So I'm going to draw in the the rage and everything and just sort of almost sp speaking to the spirits of the woods that I hunt with the way mm -hmm. Maman taught me to and I'm going to try to draw on their power to keep my rage fueled okay. uh, and I'm going to go see what that rope is leading me towards. Okay. I'm just going to do this just solely to piss Alex off. I'm not going to have you roll to get up the rope. <laughs> <laughs> Pascal will say, be careful, that rope is haunted. And then she just goes up. <laughs> and well, Alex, I'm not wearing as many, I love sitting I, with you. <laughs> I'm not wearing as many clothes to get in the way, you know. Also, I'm very used to ropes. Good to know. <laughs> I mean, as soon as, <laughs> as, as soon as Pascal says the rope is haunted... And Brigitte goes up with no problem. I'm like, that makes sense. That tracks. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Yep. That's I, true. Clearly, I, I will be making sure that she gets up okay. Uh, yep, that's what it... She had help. That's what it is. Like, you know, you loosen the jar and whatever. So, just, Brigitte... Just very quickly before we go uh, to, yeah. to Brigitte, is the other room similar? Oh. I don't uh... want to take time. I just want to make sure. No, 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 I got you. Uh, okay, go ahead. then, then, no, no, no rush, but we'll definitely uh -uh. be checking it out as well. No, because I love you. Go ahead and team me up with a spot hidden and I'll be right back. Okay. Nothing bad is going to happen, I'm sure. Uh, Brigitte, with the help of Gabriel, uh, you're able to uh, scale the rope quite easily. It is indeed not haunted. Uh, the trap door at the top uh, opens into a small space that remains under the rubble of this ruined orphanage. It appears to be part of a small office, uh, but this office is, you know, it's covered in age old dust, ash, singe, and, you know, collapsed debris. Uh, and you're looking around and you feel a moment of like disappointment uh, because you sacrificed a lot to tune into this place. And you're not seeing anything. You're seeing a burned down office and you're just getting ready to come back down to the trap door and your eyes lead up. And on the wall, there is this absolutely gorgeous, was, it's partially fired ruined now, portrait. Uh, that's showing a beautiful, you can only assume, Mademoiselle uh, de Claire, surrounded by children. She's standing outside in the garden with that angel statue, and it's this portrait of just children all around her. Uh, none of the children, from what you can tell, have smiles on their faces. None of their mouths are open. They're very cold uh, in this portrait. But the one thing that sticks out to you very darkly 
is somebody has burned out the eyes of every single one of these children. Sort of hiss at it. And it just stares coldly back at you. Someone will pay for this. And I just sort of shimmy back down the rope. Okay. And I tell Gabriel about what I saw up there. Okay. Hopping over really fast to Cesare. How'd that spot hidden do? Well, this is what I get for just sort of trying to tick off boxes and make sure that we follow up on everything. Um, we've got a 12 out of 70. So uh, while Cesare goes in, very much expecting just to see more of the same and probably has steeled himself um, for that. Uh, maybe there's something more. You've steeled yourself for what could be behind door number two. And um, relief isn't the word that hits you. I won't take that agency away from you. We do recognize there's another straw bed on the floor and another trunk uh, filled with uh, children's size lingerie. And you're just like, okay, this is more of the same. Uh, but as you are closing the trunk, you look underneath the bed uh, and you can see broken off fingernails into the wood frame of the inside of the bed. Um, in a child's handwriting, you see the word scrawled, help us. Sand check. Oh, Cesare is so cold. He makes it no problem. No problem. And that's a zero sand no loss. Um, I will, I think, call over Gabrielle um, when there is an appropriate moment show him this so that he can sort of make the decision whether it is something that he should show um, his sister. Um, player is good with everyone sort of knowing about it, but I, I don't know that Cesare would necessarily share it onwards okay. other than in that manner. Yeah, I probably would react in equal parts disgust and sort of further frustration just because it's yet another example of the innocence being abused, which is something that mother would never be okay with. And it either, it probably just continues to, to build that ferment inside that mm -hmm. someone has to be held responsible for this. There's a coldness and a stillness uh, that you all share. And from what I'm hearing, almost like a tight tether. Of, I'm hearing intensity and anger and vengeance um i also read let's burn that bitch down again so that's what you guys are experiencing as you're here um keeper wise and for the sake of time there's nothing else in this location clue wise that you guys can grab so you have cleaned it you have cleared it um you know what happened here we go but we set this room on fire first already ahead of you and i'll just pour some lit oil lan lantern oil on the wait ground. Wait for us to get out. <laughs> that that would be perfect. Like Pascal just sets the whole place on fire, and we're Good like, "Game guys, wait, how do we?" <laughs> Please continue with your narrative, Alex, because that was sexy. Please continue. Yeah, I'll start with the um with the trunk full of little kids' sexy clothes. Yeah, which is a horrible sentence to say out loud. With you, yep. Um. Yeah. And I will. I will take some of these flaming garments and just throw them around as we are leaving the room. Okay. So you guys are able to exit back into the sunshine, dreary bleak sunshine, uh, as billow of smokes, billows of smoke start, you know, following you out up the stairs and into the day air. There's something satisfying a... about that place burning. I have a thought that we should continue looking into these murders. There was far more here than I would have wished to see. However, the next murder was at a bookbinder's. Are we agreed that we proceed there next? We. Oui. And after Perhaps all, it'll be. If we have to, there are plenty of things to burn there. Oh, that's a great point. I mean, I hope it doesn't come to that. <laughs> I, I was hoping t that things would be a little less sour this mm. next site. Unfortunately, Armand, most little towns are always toxic all the way through, not just in one, one spot. <laughs> right now I am feeling like when I leave, I will burn this whole place to the ground. I'm here for that energy. 
okay. make a note whether I should, you know, how how difficult would it be to get most of the folks out of the brothel. But other mm -hmm. than that, I'm not terribly opposed to the plan. So where, where, oh, where he is, cares. <laughs> where is this bookbinder, Cesare? Yeah. I will lead the way. Okay. Um, Maybe we it, it might make sense for us to say that while I was kind of like wasting time just walking around town last night, I would have um, made sure to know where these locations were, not investigated them, but so I can find smart. my way to the bookbinder. Okay, that'll save you guys on time. No, that is perfect. Um, this is the keeper asking the players a question. That is a very intense scene. Can I get a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or in the middle of the road? How are we feeling? This is a temperature check. We're good. Everybody yeah. okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Beautiful. All right. 